I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, the one who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. In the name of that almighty, ever-living God, we welcome you to the service of worship brought to you by Malayal Baptist Church today. Our prayer is that we might magnify and exalt God, that we might get our eyes fixed afresh on his perfections, on his majesty, mercy and grace, and that we might find our hearts refreshed and equipped to live for him in our world today. We trust that you'll be blessed as you join with us today. We trust that we would be enabled to see God more fully and serve God more fully as we worship him. We're going to sing our opening hymn together just now. Creation sings the Father's song, a piece which reminds us of the cosmic proportions of what Christ Jesus has done for us in bringing us to God. Let's sing from Phil Hart's Creation Sings, the Father's Song. sings the Father's song. He calls the sun to wake the dawn and run the course of day till evening falls in crimson rays. His fingerprints in flakes of snow, his breath upon the spinning globe. He charts the eagle's flight, commands the newborn baby's cry. one in time's embrace unveil the father's plan of reconciling God and man a second Adam walked the earth whose blameless life would break the curse whose death would set us free to live with him eternally Hallelujah shall reign upon the earth the bitter wars that rage are birth pains of a coming age when he renews the land and sky all heaven will sing and earth reply with one resplendent theme the glories of our God and King As we invite all creation to stand and sing, so we too continue to lift up our voices in praise to God as we bow together and as we pray. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today that the created order is declaring that you are there, that you are God, that you are real, and that you are sovereign. We thank you that even the brokenness of our world today is demonstrating to us our need of redemption 
is giving us a thirst and an appetite for that day when Christ Jesus will be all in all and all things will be restored and renewed. We come to you today, Lord God, in the abundance of your mercy. We approach you because you've drawn near to us in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And our desire as we worship together today is that we would lift you high. Our desire is that we would see you in a way that we've never seen you before and worship you with new songs in our hearts and on our tongues. That we'd come and give you the praise and the glory that is due to your name. And Father, we recognise today that to worship you aright, we need you to enable us and empower us by your Spirit. And we pray that you would do that. And we thank you, Lord, that you can overcome our inborn limitations. You can overcome the limitations of the medium by which we worship today. And you can fill our hearts with joy as we gather in your presence and as we render to you our worship. So please bless us today, Lord God, we ask. Bless us, not just so that we might be fulfilled, but bless us so that we might bless your name and bless those around us as well. Exalt yourself, we pray, by your Spirit in the name of your Son. We pray that we would see you for all that you are and rejoice in this revelation of our great God, who is the Alpha and the Omega. Bless us, we pray, for Christ's sake. Amen. We are so grateful for the help that we're receiving in putting these services together. We're particularly grateful to Jonathan Ray, his family and friends as they provide the music for us and to Glenn Johnson who has been providing children's talks for us week by week. Glenn's going to bring us the latest of our children's talks just now. Glenn, thank you for providing these. Boys and girls, we really trust that you'll be blessed as you listen in, as you learn more from the New Testament through what Glenn shares with us today. Hello everyone. I've got my daughter Ellie with me uh, just to give us a wee hand at the start this week. So Ellie, very simple. I would like you to put your hand inside this bag, take out what's inside it, hold it up nice and high so everybody can see. Go for it. Okay, so just take out what's in there, hold it up so it's... There's nothing. There's nothing in there? No. Oh, right, okay. Oh, hang on a wee second. Sorry, I think... Uh, this is... Oh, sorry. Here you are. I need you to hold those up in two separate hands. Okay. okay so what colour is the one in your left hand? Yellow. What colour is the one in your right hand? Blue. Right. Choose one of those. You make your choice and put it inside the bag. Okay, so you've put the yellow one inside there, okay? Now I would like you to put your hand and take out that yellow scarf and show it to everybody. Okay, hold it up nice and high. Hang on a sec. Did you not put it, what did you do with the yellow one? I put it in there. Right, well hang on a sec. Put, the, put both of those, put the red one in there and the blue one in there, okay? So what colours did you just put in there? Blue and red. Okay, now I need you to put your hand and take out the blue and red scarves and hold them up and show everybody. Hi, look Ellie, come on darling, what are you doing? Where's the blue and yellow? I put them in there. Well, I tell you what, that was pretty impressive. Well done. Thank you very much indeed, Ellie. That was no great. Problem. Good. So Ellie put the yellow scarf in a change to the blue. She put the red and the blue in a change. They changed. And what I want to do this week, I want you to, to tell you another story. Last week, we thought about the story of a man who met Jesus who couldn't see. And Jesus healed him and his life completely changed. And I want to tell you another story this week about a man who completely changed. Now, he didn't go into the big bag and then come out and go, I'm different. He changed because he met Jesus. Let me explain what he was like first. He had a really important job. He was a tax collector. So he worked for the Romans. And his job was to go around all the houses. So he would go to the doors. Hello, open up, tax collecting. And they would come to the door and open the door. And he would say, uh, two gold coins, please. Now, he wasn't told to collect two gold coins. He was told to collect one. And the people would say, two, is it not just one? No, no, two coins. Hand over or there'll be trouble. So the people reluctantly gave him two coins. And this is what he did. He took one of the coins. He put it in his bag to take to the Roman governor and the authorities. He took the other coin and he put it in his pocket, kept it for himself. He stole it. He was dishonest. He told the people lies. He was not a very nice person. He didn't have very many friends at all. In fact, he had no friends. No one liked him because he was dishonest, because he took their money, he took it for themselves. And he heard on this particular day that Jesus was coming and he was excited, must have heard something about Jesus. And like the rest of the time, he went because he wanted to see Jesus. Now, he had a bit of a problem. He was very small. So when he arrived, Unfortunately already there were hundreds of people, maybe thousands of people lying in the streets where Jesus was walking and no matter how hard he tried he could see nothing because he was hidden behind all of these people. Everywhere there were people, 
Everywhere he tried to go to get a gap, there was no gap for him to fit in. And even if he could have got in, the people were saying to him, Get out of here, Zacchaeus. Why would Jesus want to see you anyway? You tell lies, you take money. Go away, no one likes you. Well, Zacchaeus wasn't put off. He really wanted to see Jesus, even though there was all these people. So he had a look and he, he looked around. What on earth can I do? And then he had a fantastic idea. He looked ahead up on the road and he saw a tree right beside the road that Jesus would be walking along. So he ran as fast as he could and he got way, way ahead of where all the crowd was and he climbed up into the tree. What a view he had. And he thought, no one will see me up here. And he watched as Jesus came walking along the road and he stopped and talked to people and walked along. And then he came to where the tree was and Jesus stopped right underneath the tree. What a view Zacchaeus had. It was amazing, better than anyone else on the ground. And as he looked down, Jesus stopped and Jesus looked right up to where Zacchaeus was in the tree and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm coming to your house for tea. Zacchaeus almost fell out of the tree. He was so shocked, but he did get down. He climbed down and he went round to where Jesus was and the people were grumbling and said, did, did we hear right? Did Jesus say he's going to Zacchaeus' house for tea? Why on earth would he go there? Surely if he's going to anyone's house, he'll come to my house. I'm a good person. There's no way he's going to go to Zacchaeus' house for tea. Surely not. Jesus did go to Zacchaeus' house for tea and he had a conversation with him. And he told Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, the way you're living is not a good way to live. Taking money from people, being dishonest, telling lies about it, it's not a good way to live. And Zacchaeus realised that and understood that and believed what Jesus said to him. And when he met Jesus that day, he was completely changed. He was a new person. And he went back to those houses that he had taken the money from. And I'm sure they thought, oh no, not him again. He's come to take even more money. But when they opened the door, he said, I'm sorry, I've been dishonest. I've taken what I shouldn't have taken. And he gave them back, not just what he had taken, he actually gave them back more than he had taken. And he also got a lot of his stuff and he gave it to the poor. That day that Zacchaeus met Jesus, his life completely changed, he completely changed. And that's what should happen when we meet Jesus. We should change completely. The Bible talks about being a new creation. It says if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And Zacchaeus, on the day he met Jesus, completely changed. And my prayer would be, as you listen this morning, you'll realise that if you're not a Christian yet, that you'll come to Jesus, that you'll give your heart to him, that you'll ask him to forgive you for the things that we've done wrong, and that you'll become a new creation. And those of us who are Christians will remember that that's how we're supposed to live every single day after we meet Jesus as changed people living differently to those around us and showing people around us that we have met Jesus and our lives have changed. Have a brilliant day. God bless. Thank you so much again, Glenn, for the time and effort that's been put into producing that children's talk for us. It's been a blessing to our hearts and it's blessed the boys and girls as they've listened today as well. We're going to sing another piece just now, a piece which reminds us of what it is to wait on God patiently and to know his answer to our prayers. I will wait for you as the peace that we'll sing. Let me invite you to join us. Lift, lift up your voice. Magnify God with us. Let's praise him. I will wait for you. Some verses from Psalm 130. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. And in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love. And with him is full redemption. places I will call. Incline your ear to me and you, and hear my cry for mercy, Lord. Were you to count my sinful ways, how could I come before your throne? Yet full forgiveness meets my 
Our scripture reading this morning comes from Romans chapter 8. We're going to read from verse 18 to 25 of this landmark chapter. We do so in the conviction that this is the word of God and we do so also with a concern that as he has spoken so we would hear him speak, that we take seriously what it is to listen to the word of God and that we'd be asking God by his spirit to apply this word to us and help us to take it to heart. It's Romans chapter 8 verses 18 to 25. Let's hear the word of God. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it and hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope, we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. May God bless his word to our hearts today. Amen. Very grateful to one of our church elders, Richard Donnan, who's now going to lead us in prayer before we come and consider God's word together. Let us still our hearts, bow our heads, and let's come before God now in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, another opportunity to praise and worship you. For you alone are worthy of praise and worship. We are conscious that we come before a holy and almighty God, the one who created all things, who sustains all things and is sovereign and ruler over all. 
And yet we thank you that you are a God that is not distant from us, but one who knows us, cares for us, and loves each one of us intimately. And that you demonstrated your love for us in sending your only son Jesus into this world to live a perfect life, die a sacrificial death, and rise again from the dead, so that in trusting in Jesus, we can have forgiveness of sins, the hope of eternal life, and a restored relationship with you, our Heavenly Father. And we thank you that as our Heavenly Father, you encourage us to bring our cares and our concerns before you. And so today, we pray for those who are most in need. We pray for those who are persevering and struggling with long-term illness. We pray for those who are perhaps coping with the loss of a loved one or are caring for loved ones who need your help. We pray for those who are perhaps struggling with isolation and loneliness and the additional physical, mental and spiritual pressures that that can bring. And we pray for those who are serving in our frontline services providing care where it's needed most and protecting us. Heavenly Father, we just pray that in each of these situations that the people will feel a very real sense of your presence, your comfort and your strength, a peace that passes all understanding that can only come from you, our loving Heavenly Father. And we pray that as we move out of this lockdown phase, that you will give wisdom to those who are governing over us and making the key decisions, and that you'll give us wisdom and help us to act responsibly and in love towards others as we also adjust to this new normal. And now, Heavenly Father, as we turn to your word, we pray that you would give us open and willing hearts to receive what you have to say to us through your word, And that your Holy Spirit will use your word to either draw us to Christ for the first time or that if we know him as our saviour to continue to transform and change us and to make us more like Jesus. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. When publicity and reality are at odds with one another we find ourselves bitterly disappointed as human beings. That's true of the child who watches a heavily stylized advert for a toy on the television or on the internet and then when it arrives it doesn't deliver what it promised. It's true of us as adults as well. We pin our hopes perhaps on a product or on a personality or on our employment and when they don't deliver what we were told they'll deliver we find ourselves robbed of joy. We feel ourselves to have been deprived of what was guaranteed to us. The Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, as the Apostle Paul spells it out in the book of Romans, is a message which is high in expectations. It's a message which promises so much to the individual and promises so much to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul has written this document. It's a letter and it's written to a first century group of Christians living in the city of Rome. And he writes this letter for a number of reasons. One of them is a missionary reason. He wants to get the gospel to Spain and he hopes that he can come to Rome and use that as a springboard by which he might take the gospel further. And so he writes to these Christians to share with them about what he preaches and what his aspirations are, what he longs for and desires as a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ and also the content of the message that he proclaims. But he writes as well to encourage these Christians to refresh their memories, to reinforce for them what it is that he believes and what it is that they believe. He seeks to outline for them and diagram for them some of the details and dimensions of what trusting in Jesus has meant. That's part of what makes Romans a book that we return to over and over again because its portrayal of the gospel is so densely realised and so deeply helpful to us. Not just at an intellectual level where we know more, but at a personal and affectional level where our hearts are drawn out further and further to God to realise just what he has achieved for us in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 8 is a particularly high point in the book of Romans. It's a chapter that Christians turn to time and again. It's a passage that we quote from quite often, particularly when we face adversity and difficulty and when we need our hope reinforced and recharged. 
And Paul has been doing some remarkable things in Romans 8. This is an interim conclusion to the argument that he's made right from chapter 1. Paul's argument has been that all of humanity stands condemned under the law of God. And he's been very careful in how he has spelled that out with forensic skill and with a huge eye to detail. He proves that both the religious and the rebel stand condemned before the Lord. Paul makes this case in Romans 1 to 3. And by verse 23 of that chapter, chapter 3, he says that all of us have sinned and all of us fall short of the glory of God. Paul draws this line of judgment under all of humanity and says none of us are right with God and none of us can get to God. And then in some of the most soaring prose that exists in all of human literature, Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, spells out in compelling detail with forceful vocabulary what has happened when the Christian has come to trust in Christ. He's shown the sufficiency and the efficiency of the work of Christ on the cross. He shows that Jesus has come to solve our deepest human dilemma as human beings. He shows that Christ has been set forth as a sacrifice of atonement so that our sins can be forgiven and so we can know peace with God. And in chapters 4 and 5 of Romans, Paul has spelled out the singularity of faith, that it's by faith alone and Christ alone that our sins are dealt with and that we're reconciled to God. And that reconciliation is not superficial, it's fundamental and relational. So in Romans 5, we not only are justified through Christ, but we have peace with God. We can approach God and we live in the identity of God. In chapter 6 and 7, Paul has mopped up some of the pastoral issues that arise out of a gospel which says it's by faith alone and not by our works. And he shows the synergy that there is uh, between our trusting in Christ and then that working itself out in a changed life. In chapter 7, he has spelled out as well some of the frustrations and difficulties that are part and parcel of the Christian walk. Some of the the tensions that, that we experience as we seek to serve Christ in a world where we are tempted and where we sin. And then in Romans chapter 8, Paul has brought this amazing flourish of truth. He has spelled out for these believers just something of the, the glory and the depth of what Jesus has done. Chapter 8 begins with that well-known verse, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And from there, he spells out the fact that the Christian now has a whole new liberty. They're free from the law of sin and death and they have a whole new life. They are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Now they're beginning to see progress in holiness. Now they're beginning to have a hope that transcends present circumstance. Now they have a life that they didn't enjoy before. Now they identify through union with Christ, with the living God. And so those are extremely high truths. Those are amazing facets of what the gospel has done. But Paul is concerned here that he does not give us all of that positive message and not speak to us with reality, speak to his original hearers and to us as well with reality about what Christian discipleship is. And so in verses, verse 15 of, of Romans 8, Paul has said that the believer's privilege is that they are now adopted by God. They can cry out to God by the Spirit, Abba, Father. They have not just proximity to God, but intimacy with him. They relate to him in a way that they never could have done before. And that adoption then has some implications, verses 16 and 17 of Romans 8. One of the implications is that we are now heirs of God. We now are in God's will, as it were. We are guaranteed to share in the glory that is Christ. We are joint heirs with Christ. That truth should make the heart sing. That truth should make the spirit soar. That truth should elevate our thinking about exactly what the gospel does, exactly the degree to which we are delivered from punishment and wrath in the gospel, but delivered to glory in Christ. But Paul now tempers that with other truth. And so if you look at verse 17 of Romans 8, he says that we are heirs of God, fellow heirs of Christ, and then there is a proviso. Provided, he says, we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So Paul is painstakingly showing here that the Christian's hope is a hope which is tempered and held in tension with the trouble and the difficulty that they will face before Christ returns. And that theme then runs in to verses 18 to 25 and right through the rest of the chapter. And so in verse 18, we have this statement that Paul makes. I consider, he says, that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So Paul says, we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. 
We have high expectations and high hopes as believers, but we know as well that suffering is a reality. But Paul says in context, that suffering doesn't compare with the hope that we have. He says, I do a calculation, I, I toll it up, I do some addition and subtraction, and here's my conclusion. These sufferings that are just for the present time, these difficulties that we face and experience, can't compare at all with the glory that will be revealed. And, and probably the best way of reading verse 18 is the glory that will be revealed in us. So Paul says we, we are suffering now, we struggle now. Our Christian experience is one of vexation and difficulty, but we know all the while that glory is coming with Christ. And so we weigh our sufferings on one side and we weigh the weight of glory on the other. And glory is so much heavier. It far outweighs what we experience. That truth then leads us into the main teaching of verses 18 to 25. In fact, verse 18 stands at the head of the rest of Romans chapter 8. So if Paul says that our experience is that, yes, we have received this glorious gospel, but we suffer now, then what's it like to live in the world as a believer? And how do we hold on to hope? Well, there's two things that Paul talks about in verses 19 to 25 of this chapter. I want to highlight those for you this morning and trust they'll be a blessing to our hearts as we not only appreciate what Paul says, but appropriate that into our lives as we seek to walk with God. Firstly, Paul speaks about a groaning creation. And then secondly, he speaks about the groaning Christian. He's going to spell out for us the reality of the suffering that is part and parcel of our human experience, part and parcel of our Christian discipleship. And then he's going to offset all of that with the beauty and the glory of the gospel. So first of all, then, we see in verses 19 down to verse 22, Paul speaks about a groaning creation. Paul says, now we're in this world. We are in this um, strange uh, position where we are heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. We are living in expectation of, of high and grand things because of the gospel. But we suffer. And not only that, but we suffer in a world of suffering. Verse 19, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. The believer finds themselves in a context and in a cosmos which is afflicted and conflicted by the reality of sin. The creation that we inhabit is waiting for the fact that one day will come when we as Christians will be revealed as belonging to Christ, when the full glory of Christ comes not only to us, but is resplendent in us, and we're transformed at his appearing and his return. And so the, the created order, the animate and inanimate world, is, is waiting for the redemption that's yet to come, the, the, the revealing of the sons and daughters of God. And as it waits, it groans. Verse 20, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the glory, the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So Paul says, you might be joint heirs with Christ. You might be living in expectation of heaven. You might be rejoicing that there's no condemnation, but the very world that you live in is waiting for the day when that becomes apparent, whenever sin is no more. And until then, Paul says, the creation groans. The creation labours under the weight of Adam's sin. It labours under the weight of futility and of, of complexity and of suffering and adversity that's part and parcel of creation since Adam fell. So verse 22, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Paul says creation is waiting with bated breath. That eager expectation that's spoken of is literally um, the idea of an enduring and hopeful waiting. It's used in contemporary literature with the New Testament of uh, a person waiting on the roadside for another person to arrive, looking and watching and waiting and hoping and expecting. And Paul says the, 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 the grandeur of the gospel is of such weight and such, such glory 
that the created order, which is, is suffering and is unstable and is unpredictable and is futile in some ways, is waiting for the day when Christ appears and when Christ comes. That's, that's how cosmic this gospel is. This is not just a matter, Roman believers, of you trusting in Christ and it being a merely individualized or personalized experience, which of course it is, but there is this cosmic element, there is this universal element that, that the world is waiting and watching and hoping and longing and expectation, in great expectation, for the day when Christ comes and all is made right and when glory is made apparent. Now that truth helps us actually, it helps us in so many ways. It helps us to understand, first of all, the world that we're living in. It makes sense of the evidence that's all around us, that we live in a a cosmos, we live on a planet which, which groans, a planet which is broken, a planet that is vexed with suffering, an environment which is red and tooth and claw, an environment which is vulnerable not just to human exploitation but to, to natural disasters and to, to all sorts of cataclysms that can be visited on it. There's very few human beings alive today who, who don't see that evidence but our wider beliefs determine how we interpret it. And so our wider society today can see what Paul's talking about here in Romans 8, that the creation is groaning, that there is this sense of futility and adversity built into the warp and woof of the world. But our society sees that as being an argument for us being our own saviours and us trying to deliver ourselves from a future which is the product of our past and our present. Paul says that groaning in the planet is, is evidence of the fact that all is not as it should be. The, the, the conflict that we see right down to a microscopic level in our world and right out to that macro level of these huge events that rock and shock us, the advent of earthquake and volcano, the insidious um, infections that make their way around our world, the current conditions that we live in today where public health is suppressed and human freedoms are repressed. All of this is, is, is demonstrative of the fact that we're living in a fallen world But where humanity without God sees those as the death throes and the death pains of the world, the Apostle Paul says these are the pains of childbirth. These these pains are not merely destructive, but they are productive. Paul says they're like contractions that a woman experiences when a baby is very close to birth. That these are, are pains which will eventually bring forth beauty and joy and wonder and new life. And so this helps us to make sense of our world as Christians. One of the most popular things that people will say to us, particularly at a time like the one we're living through right now, is if there's a good God, then why is there so much suffering? I think Paul would have taken us to this paragraph of this book that he writes, this letter that he writes to the Romans. Because here he explains the world is not what it was created to be originally. It's been subjected and hope God has subjected it to futility. There are waste places, there are thorns and thistles and briars and heartbreaks and problems and ruptures and, and movement of tectonic plates which, which cause so much grief and destruction. There are floods and there are tsunamis and there's all sorts of afflictions and conflict and difficulty and all of that is pointing to the fact That even though things are not as they should be now, a day is coming when they shall be. This is creation groaning in those contractions and waiting for Christ to come. Waiting for the day when believers are are transformed into the likeness of Jesus and when the creation itself is renewed afresh. Not only does that help us understand our world, but it helps us understand something of the centrality of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the dangers that we face in the 21st century is that we privatise Christianity. We come to believe the lie that society tells us, that these beliefs are okay as long as they remain in the private sphere, that this truth is okay for us and it's okay for us to believe it fervently, but not to believe it says anything more widely to the the world around us. But Romans chapter 8 says that this gospel has global impact, it has ramifications that transcend our immediate concerns and our immediate lives, that this is a a whole world gospel. And even the the world around us, the soil and the animal life and the, 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 the 
pure and raw biology of our world has built into it this expectation of Christ's coming so that when he's revealed and when we're revealed as being sons of glory then creation will tune itself to that beautiful tone and that beautiful note and all will be in harmony once again and all will be right in a new heavens and a new earth. This is the gospel you've believed. That, that day or that evening when you trusted Christ, when you, when you took that step, you didn't realise that what you were believing into was not just something that delivered you personally, but delivers creation. And creation waits for it and groans for it and longs for it and suffers in the absence of the revelation of Christ's glory, the glory of which we are joint heirs. So there's a groaning creation that Paul speaks of here in these verses, but there are also groaning Christians. Verse 23 and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Paul says what's, what's happening on the grand scale in creation is happening in the individual Christian. We suffer. That's a theme which will run like a stream right through the rest of the verses of Romans 8. The Christian, though, though no longer under condemnation, the Christian, though now enjoying a whole new liberty and a whole new life and a whole new way of living, the Christian is living in a world where, where suffering is a reality and they are not immune from it and they are not above it because we, Paul says, we groan inwardly. We have the first fruits of the Spirit. We're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Christ himself lives within us. We have this down payment of the glory that one day will be powerfully and publicly and, and globally revealed in us. But for now we groan, for now we suffer, for now we wait. But our waiting is with great expectation. Paul says we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons. We wait with that same endurance and, 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 and power that creation waits for. What are we waiting for? Adoption as sons. Now Paul has already said um, in verse 15 that we've received the spirit of adoption. We cry out now, Abba, Father, but we're waiting for the day when that adoption is finalised and formalised and publicised and when we as believers are shown demonstrably to belong to God and to be his children. We wait for that with eager expectation. What are we waiting for then? We're waiting for verse 23, the redemption of our bodies. Waiting for that day when uh, the body which is dying because of sin, Paul has talked about that already in the earlier part of the chapter. Verse 10, if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. We're waiting for the day when there is not that disparity, when there's not that conflict, when there's not that division between what we experience internally as God renews us day by day by a spirit with this decaying body that we carry around, this, this culture and corpus of death, which is part and parcel of our experience. We're waiting for the redemption of our bodies, Paul says. And so now we're groaning, we're suffering, but we're doing so with this joyous hope. So Paul says, verse 24, for in this hope we were saved. All of these great and grand things that Romans 8 has laid out as belonging to the believer are not publicity and reality at odds with one another, but Paul's saying we we, we came to Christ knowing that we had hope. And what is hope? Well, he says, hope that's seen is not hope. We don't hope for what we already have. We enjoy what we already have. But we hope for what's yet to come. Paul says we understood that when we became Christians. That our ultimate hope, our, our final hope, our joyous and glorious hope is in the final day when Christ appears. And so we live with this expectation. Verse 25, we hope for what we do not see. And we wait for it with patience. So, so Paul says, all of this is yours. All of this gospel truth is real. It does measure up. There's no disparity. But there must be patience. Though you belong to Christ, you're suffering now. But though you suffer now, you suffer with hope and with joy in Christ. How this should speak to us today. We're becoming familiarised again with suffering, aren't we? 
maybe you're watching this and you've needed no refamiliarization with it. Perhaps much of your life and much of your experience has entailed suffering as a Christian. Well, this this passage helps you come to terms with the reality of the fact that that we live in the the already of what Christ has done. The Spirit dwells in us as first fruits. That's the 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 image that comes from Israel's harvest time when the the first part of the crop we brought in and assurance that the rest would follow. We've got the first fruits of the Spirit. But we're waiting for harvest day when Christ comes. And all of this suffering, Paul says in verse 18, won't compare with that glory that's going to be revealed in us. We look back at this as what Paul describes elsewhere in the New Testament as light and momentary affliction, working for us a far greater weight of glory. And so if suffering has been your portion and been your part for many years, let me say to you, continue to wait on and continue to expect and continue to be patient because these great expectations that we have will be finally and fully and joyously and beautifully and wondrously revealed when Christ appears and it's worth holding on to hope. And if we become re-familiarised with with suffering through these coronavirus days, through COVID-19, through the troubles and the trials that our whole world is facing, as believers, we have this, this inherent hope in Christ. We have this joyous expectation that though it's hard now, it shall not always be this way. It shall not always be like this. And the day is coming when our bodies will be redeemed, when our sonship, our adoption will be revealed, when our Jesus will be witnessed in the flesh, when we'll see him in his majesty and in his glory and we will rejoice. And that then fuels our endurance now. We eagerly await for Christ to come. We eagerly await for that glory that arrives, which will put into microscopic scale the enormity of the troubles and the difficulties we face today. Suffering believer, our hope is not some sense of stoicism, which pretends things aren't as hard as they seem. It's it's joyful gospel living, which holds on to the suffering now, weighs it and sees it and feels it and, and bears it, but also compares it to the glory that's in Christ Jesus. Would you lift your eyes to him? Would you see him afresh today? Would you, you see that this hope is worth waiting for? This hope is worth holding to? This day of glory will be beyond our imagination and even beyond our expectation. And if you're not a Christian listening to this service today, I want to say to you, this is something of the scope and scale of the gospel that we believe. We have not come to believe in some parochial, domesticated little message that just stands as a crutch for our suffering. But as Christians, we believe in this, this global, cosmic, universe renewing gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel makes sense of our human predicament like no other philosophy, like, like no other ideology, because it shows to us the reality that we are broken people living in a broken world, but faith in Christ is transformative of that now, so that our perspective shifts and changes, and it will be transformative of that in glory when he appears. And so if you put your faith and trust in Christ for salvation, if you ask him to take away your sins, you're investing your hope in a message which is real and substantial and will be revealed at the final day. Would you trust him? Would you receive not only the forgiveness of your sins, but the guarantee of the redemption of your body and of a hope that transcends even the grave? Common repentance and faith and trust in Christ. What a gospel we have believed. We live now in a groaning creation. We live now as groaning Christians, but we do so knowing that the glory to be revealed will be far greater. That our hope is worth holding on to. That our Saviour will make it all right and all real when he appears. May God bless his word. Amen. Thank you once again for joining us today. We're going to conclude this service of worship by singing together again, Jesus shall reign where'er the sun. Let's praise God for his sovereignty and his majesty by singing this song together. And then after we've sung it, I'll close in prayer. Let's sing, Jesus shall reign.
Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you that you are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the one who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And we thank you that our lives, our destiny, our eternity, our joy, our hope, our aspiration, all rest and dwell in the person of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in what he has already achieved for us through his death and resurrection and what we long for now, his appearing when we shall be transformed into his likeness. Thank you for the opportunity to think and dwell on these truths today. Embed them in our hearts, Lord God. Nestle them in our consciences and help us to live our lives according to the hope that you've given to us in Christ Jesus. Thank you for your help today. Thank you for your mercy to us. Bless us as we go into another week. Keep us conscious, Lord God, that we are waiting and help us to know day by day that we are waiting in eager expectation and in hope of the coming of Christ. Thank you for your blessing. We worship you together today. And now may your grace and mercy and peace be ours in abundance. For Christ's sake. Amen.